moon, which a bunch of you probably recognize. <laughs> Fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, darling, kiss me. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, Hold my hand, in other words, darling, kiss me. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. Institute, you can't disparage. Ask the local gentry, and they will say it's elementary. Try, try, try to separate the myths and illusion. Try, 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 and you will only come to one conclusion. Love and marriage, love and marriage. Together like the horse and carrot, Dad was told by Mother, you can't have one without the other. Here's a slightly earlier one, although it got some play later on. I am dreaming, dear, of you day by day. Dreaming when the skies are blue, when the gray, when the silvery moonlight gleams. Still I wander on in dreams in a land of love. It seems just with you. Let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love with you. Let me hear you whisper that you love me too. Keep the love light glowing in your eyes so true. Let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love. Just you. Let me call you sweetheart. I'm in love with you. Let me 
lived to be uh, to age 93, fought in the Italian army in a conflict with the Austro-Hungarian Empire in northern Italy in 1910 into the uh, Ottoman Empire. And a lot of action was going on up there. Uh, our stories from him to us were he didn't like war very much, and uh, for a lot of the young men in the Italian army around that time, trench wars and things like that were just starting to come into play. Uh, that was sort of their, their ticket to come to the, the Stati Uniti and uh, end up in New York a few weeks later. Um, so uh, that was really the extent of our, our family traditions in, in the military realm. So it was sort of unlikely that when the call to duty came that Leonard would sign up. Um, of course, now that we all uh, kind of know his uh, story, no surprise that he chose the most difficult duty possible which was in the Marine paratroopers. He always said that he did it because they got paid about $3 more a week, something like that. But the return on that investment was really small because uh, it was extremely difficult duty. They were the Navy SEALs of the day, pretty much. Uh, they were in the air coming down, but later on they found out it was probably more efficient to come from underwater and come up. But anyway, uh, Fast forwarding, he ends up in the, in the middle of these vicious battles in the Pacific Campaign. Vela La Vela, Guadalcanal, um, Bougainville, which uh, and, uh, the, the boys uh, heard a lot about what happened in Bougainville, which was about maybe a year, year and a half before Iwo Jima, which was a much more difficult experience for him than was Iwo Jima. He said he was almost lucky on Iwo Jima when he was hit because he got his ticket off the island on about the third day of the battle. Bougainville, if you're, any of you are interested, look it up, was a different situation. So he was pretty uh, battle-hardened by the time the, uh, the invasion of the beach at Iwo Jima happened. He ended up decorated as a hero, although anytime that word came up with him in mixed company, it would be, I'm not a hero, the hero are the guys that didn't make it back. And he repeated that to me and wanted to make sure I expressed that to you. Uh, but Silver Star, Valor, line of duty, rescued a comrade who had been mortally wounded, and then sustained life-threatening wounds himself, uh, obviously survived, and uh, got ready for the invasion of what they thought would be the invasion of Japan uh, later on, about six months later, and then we know how that all kind of ended in August of 1945. So he became a peacekeeper. So he got to do a little, uh, a little R and R. He called it in Japan, in Sasebo, Japan, as a peacekeeper, and we still have some mementos from that. I have a rifle, a Japanese Imperial rifle, in my uh, uh, my garage that, that came from that, and a little trophy that the guys would bring back. And also, uh, we have a little um, um, binder that he had, taking records and, and counting the number of rifles in the armories that uh, it was his duty to go ahead and and kind of disarm the, uh, the former enemy. Anyway, my father and men and women who risked and sacrificed their lives there, the Admiral of the Fleet, uh, Admiral Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the, of the Fleet, wrote the following, by their victory, the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions and other units of the 5th Amphibious, Amphibious Corps have made a, an accounting to their country which only history will be able to val value fully. Amongst the Americans serving on the island, on Iwo Island, uncommon valor was a common virtue. And when I first heard that, I thought, you know, those are nice, pretty words, but what does that really mean? And what is this, this idea of virtue? And though he was recognized for an act of valor in a war that was acclaimed and celebrated in, in his life, a lot of people really looked up to him for that and kind of identified him with that. He wasn't really that kind of guy. He wasn't a a war-making kind of military kind of guy. He didn't really like the military. He got, uh, he got uh, commended for uh, a career in the military, but it was not his deal. And uh, so he did his part. Uh, he uh, accepted the call of duty and his responsibility, but acted in a, in a courageous way, I, I think because of the nature of who he was and, and, and his background. So. We'll talk a little bit about some stories that happened in his life afterwards, and, and that's uh, the part that I'm sure we're going to hear uh, in the room soon. Um, I'll tell a story, if there's time, about uh, my own experience uh, about how his uh, virtue 
and uh, who he was actually played out in uh, a non-military kind of way. I believe he was born and raised to be a virtuous person because of the love and attention of his parents, his faith in God, his love of country, and his membership in a faith community. Furthermore, he was able to maintain the state of virtuousness as a result of the support and unwavering love of his life partner and wife, Joan. And uh, <laughs> as well as the support of all of you, deep enduring friendships and caring relationships with neighbors, co-workers, extended family members, and, and relatives. Um, so Leonard lived his life in a state of what uh, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, 4th century BC stuff, called eudaimonia, which is variously translated from the Greek as meaning well-being, happiness, blessedness, and in the context of, of the definition of this virtue, uh, there's a study called virtue ethics, human flourishing, and I think that really captures Uncle Len, right, Pop. <clears throat> your husband and, and all about who he was. So um, what are virtues, their attitudes, dispositions, and character traits that enable us to be and act in ways that develop our potential? <coughs> Examples of virtues are honesty, courage, compassion, generosity, fidelity, integrity, fairness, self-control, and prudence. Kind of sounds like Leonard, <laughs> right? Yeah, sounds like Uncle Len, Pop, Coach Peachy, for many of you in here, and, uh, and Da Vinci, your husband. His mom would often call him Da Vinci, usually in a, in a, when she was uh, being affectionate with him. But sometimes if she was a little maybe put out with him and needed to catch his attention. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, Additionally, from that, Aristotle said, whatever we learn to do, this is really all about doing stuff. So he was a, a man of action, as you know, in his whole life, not just the military uh, version of it. <coughs> whatever we learn to do, we learn by actually doing it. Men come to be builders, for instance, by building. Harp players come to be harp players by playing the harp. In the same way, doing just acts, by doing just acts, we come to be just. By doing self-controlled acts, we come to be self-controlled. And by doing brave acts, we become brave. And so I think that's how folks that are naturally courageous and, and, and have all of those, uh, most of the components uh, of what we call virtues, when they're put in, in difficult situations, they rise to the top and they, they, they shine and, and, and become the kind of human beings that we uh, we would all like to emulate. Uh, <coughs> Admiral Nimitz was really great with, with quotes. He basically uh, said this of the dedication and service of people like Leonard and his comrades in arms at that point in the world history. Uh, we have a solemn obligation, the obligation to ensure that their sacrifice will help make this a better and safer world in which to live. So both for those of us who were privileged to know and love Leonard, and others like him from the greatest generation, which we have a few members here and uh, still with us. Uh, we too should be sure to do our part to live our lives with the bar of virtue raised high enough to assure that this story, an example of a life lived fully and well, can be passed down through the generations. So in closing, I'd like to quote an excerpt from uh, a, a creed of a fraternity that I happen to be uh, part of and still am um, uh, from my college days when we have a few of the members of, uh, of that uh, UCLA chapter here with us today. And the theme of this piece, to just put it in context, is written in 1868 soon after the end of the Civil War by a cadet at a uh, newly founded group uh, founded by um, some um, students and cadets at the Virginia Military Institute, uh, which is written as follows. To believe in the life of love, walk in the way of honor, serve in the light of truth, and to keep green the sainted memory of our loved and lost, their faults forgotten, their virtues enshrined in our hearts forever. To try bravely to do unto our fellow men as they would do unto us, reckoning not their lineage nor their wealth, 
but esteeming their manhood and sisterhood, I added that part, <laughs> above their badge of rank. That was 120 years ago. So. To let their lives be led by the spirits of gentleness, justice, and mercy. And so to be true to the knighthood of love. Okay, during the last few days before Leonard passed, he and I were able to share some quiet time together, really just intensive silence, as well as to watch a few sporting events. Uh, and right up until the end, maybe the last day, he was still arguing over the calls and, you know, disputing, right, the uh, officiating. It was wonderful to see. And we shared listening to some of his favorite opera arias, <coughs> especially when performed by Luciano. Pavarotti and, uh, and some of the other more modern artists. Though not written specifically as an operatic aria, uh, you'll hear a number at the closing of our session again, but in the a cappella version uh, of uh, Conte Parturo, which was the last uh, number, as Leonard would call them, um, in, the, uh, in the church service. That means, with you I will leave. And with that, I'll open up the floor to those of you who uh, would like to make some comments. Merck, introduce yourself. <laughs> I'll uh, speak from back here. I think everybody can hear my voice. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story uh, of Leonard that you didn't know. Uh, most of the people in here, uh, I happen to be in education for 55 years. Uh, I was uh, 16 years old, and I was a high school football player in San Bernardino High School. Hey. <laughs> Very few people when you talk about San Bernardino <laughs> cheer, so <laughs> I live there still. I was pretty weird. Anyway, I was 16 years old and I was a football player and I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, I was called up to the varsity. Uh, I had to take a class from Leonard Peachy, as he insisted we call him. And it was very interesting because Leonard taught a physical fitness class. And I'll never forget this, and I don't even think the boys know it. Jones probably never heard it. Uh, there was a 10-foot square plank of wood in the middle of the football field. And it had four iron posts on it with a small ladder. Leonard would get on top of that and lead calisthenics. We did up and downs. We did push-ups. We did setups. While we were doing push-ups with two hands, Leonard was doing them with one. <laughs> and he became my coach uh, in high school. All of a sudden, I went away to school, came back. I happened to sign my first contract at Pacific High School in San Bernardino. And Leonard happened to be an assistant coach with a gentleman by the name of Carl Schiller. And they were, one was 21 years, one was 21 years old and the other was 22 and I was kind of the baby of the group. Uh, and as a result of that, I got to know them there as a coach. All of a sudden, they opened up a new high school in San Bernardino called San Gorgonio High School. And Carl Schiller became the head football coach and decided that the two assistants that he would like to bring with him were Carl and myself. I am Leonard and myself. So Leonard Peachy and I became assistants at San Gorgonio. We were there for two years. Uh, I had always marveled at Leonard, and ladies, please excuse me, in the locker room, Leonard would take his shirt off, and he had a huge scar on his chest. And I didn't have enough guts to ask him. I was afraid to ask him, so I went to Carl Scheller, and I said, Carl, I said, tell me about it. And I went to Leonard first, and I said, Leonard, tell me about the scar. He goes, ah, I'll tell you later. Don't worry about it. And I said, okay. I figured I'd, I'd be polite. I went to Carl and asked him where the scar was from. And of course, it was from the war, from a bayonet uh, that occurred during World War II that you heard part of the story from, from Greg. And after that, I had no idea what Leonard had done in the war. He had never mentioned any type of activity. I never heard him uh, mention any, anything along the way except to Carl. And Carl Scheller would always relate to me the stories about Leonard. Then Carl got the head job at Cypress Community College in Cypress. I was born and raised in San Bernardino. 
went to school there. That's how come I knew Leonard and Carl. Uh, when Carl became the head football coach, he asked two assistants to go with him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Carl Schiller, and myself. And uh, actually, to make a long story short, and I'll share it really quick because I know there's a lot of other people who would like to speak, I became the Dean of PDN Athletics at Cypress College, and I was there for 13 years, and Leonard and Carl both worked for me at that particular time just before they retired. And I will tell you, I go back, I've been in education for 55 years, and you're talking about a real man when you talk about Leonard. And you'll have to excuse me, it was very difficult for me over a period of time to be with Leonard and Carl and establish some of the virtues and principles that Greg talked about. And that's the story that some of you may have never heard. And I'm not sure the boys have even heard those stories. So thank you for listening. Thank you. And Carol Ann, as her dad, I get to say this. Speak up! <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna, I wrote a, a little bit uh, of my own. Uh, louder, louder! <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, of course, it's sad to say goodbye to Grandpa, but I feel so lucky to have had him around for so long. And I'm still lucky to have Grandma here. Um, my memories of him from childhood are clear as day, picking vegetables in his garden, Grandpa telling us to be careful of the sharp fish bones in the soil that he used to nurture his plants, listening in awe to Grandpa as Grandpa told his infamous, infamous stories from his big reclining chair, and of course his singing. If I was sad, the singing would instantly cheer me up, and every year I would look forward to hearing him sing happy birthday to me over the phone. In fact, most of his children and grandchildren are musically inclined, probably because we were influenced by him. Getting to know a person as an adult is a whole different story. I feel infinitely blessed to have had the opportunity to spend so much time with Grandpa when I was old enough to really appreciate him as a person. Grandpa has always been a role model for me. He was a rare kind of person, very strong and tough, very macho and masculine, but at the same time, very emotional, sensitive, and mystical. Always very interested in people, always brave, motivated, and competitive, and up for a good challenge. Uh, even up toward the end, there was uh, a day, oh, I wrote this little story down because I was remembering. Um, my mom was just for fun quizzing me on phone numbers from her phone, and Grandpa said, that's easy, I can do that. And he also started reciting the phone numbers from memory. Um, so, uh, not only was he competitive, but he could admit when he was wrong, which is important. He could laugh at himself, too. And so I want to share a story that Grandma Joan wrote, because she used to write children's stories. And uh, this one, uh, she has a little note in here. Uh, a bigger and better brown rabbit. Someday you will figure out why it sounds like Grandpa. <laughs> I'm just going to read a little part of it, because it's sort of long. but. Uh, the Bigger and Better Brown Rabbit is a funny name for any rabbit, but this brown rabbit deserved the name because he was, was bigger than all the other rabbits and boasted, I can do anything better than any other <coughs> rabbit. Now, of course, the other rabbits could see that Brown Rabbit really was bigger than any of them. He was much taller, his ears were much longer, his mouth was much wider, his feet were much bigger, and his legs were much, much longer. But they did not believe that Brown Rabbit really could do everything better than any other rabbit. They were sure Brown Rabbit was just boasting. Every year the rabbits had a county fair, and during the week of the fair there were many contests. Brown Rabbit was eager to enter the contest because he was sure that he really was bigger and that really was the bigger and better rabbit. So to summarize, um, there's a, a one-mile race. The Brown Rabbit wins the one-mile race. Jumping contest, crushes that. In the lettuce eating contest, he is. Uh, he, prevails again. And then lastly, um, let's see. Um, so it's a berry picking contest. Where is it? 
Okay. Uh, okay, the judge blew his whistle and the rabbit started picking berries as fast as they could. Each rabbit filled his little pail with berries and then emptied it into his big basket. Then the rabbits would hurry to fill their pails with berries again. Brown rabbit thought, this pail is much too small for me. I can never win the contest this way. So brown rabbit threw the little pail away. He took off his big hat and started putting berries in that. Suddenly the rabbits that were watching started laughing. Brown rabbit thought that they were laughing because he was so far ahead of the rest. He kept picking berries faster and faster, but his big hat never seemed to get full. <coughs> Gray rabbit, spotted rabbit, and white rabbit were running back and forth, emptying their little pails of berries into their big baskets. Then the judge blew his whistle. The contest was over. Everyone could see that spotted rabbit had won the contest. His basket was filled to the top of berries. Gray rabbit's basket and white rabbit's baskets were almost full. And brown rabbit had only a few berries in the bottom of his basket. Spotted rabbit is the winner, announced the judge. Brown rabbit was sad. He couldn't understand why he had lost the contest. After all, I'm a bigger and better brown rabbit, he thought. He walked over to the grass and sat down by himself. Then the rabbits came over to where brown rabbit was sitting on the grass. The rabbits were still laughing. One rabbit picked up brown rabbit's hat and started filling it with berries. Then he held up the hat so brown rabbit could see what was happening. The berries were falling out at the bottom almost as fast as the rabbit was putting them in. Brown rabbit had been so anxious to win that he had forgotten that his hat had two big holes in the crown for his ears to stick through. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the berries he had picked had fallen out of the holes. Now brown rabbit was ashamed of himself for boasting so much. He didn't say anything for a long time. He just sat there. Then brown rabbit started laughing. It was a pretty good joke after all, and he had played it on himself. Soon all the rabbits were laughing with him. They laughed so hard that soon they were all rolling in the grass, and the bigger and better brown rabbit laughed bigger and better than all the rest. Uh, I want to comment on the, the flag folding today for our uh, great father that, that helped serve in the, the Marines in World War II, not because he was a patriot, but it was just his you know, just the way it was. And uh, the, while I watched them fold the flag up in little triangles very slowly, one side after another, reminded me of the way he would uh, tackle a project, specifically our cars. <laughs> and he would, he, would, he would hesitate to work on them and go help us out and, uh, to fix our cars. And he would take so long to get things done. So long. He would, he, but he wouldn't just sit around and analyze it. He'd just he'd get to work and he'd, he'd you know, take them with a little screws. And maybe I'm a bit impatient. You know, so. But, he, but uh, flag folding reminded me of how he took every, everything he did and fixed it. He was uh, exercised. None of you know that he was in good shape, right? <laughs> <laughs> but he ran, lifted weights in the garage. Sounds familiar. <laughs> and uh, went fishing. Um, and also, he would, uh, he'd run in 10 Ks. When they first started the 10 Ks in, in uh, North County, San Diego, Age categories, and he was in like 50. And there weren't that many people in that category. And he would end up um, on a beach run, coming in first, second, or third place, and he'd come home with a with an award, and he'd do the one after another after another. Just amazing. And his ripe old age is like 60, maybe 50 or 60. I thought it was pretty old. But not even that old. Gotta start running 10 Ks. Yeah, and uh, he was also uh, honest and forthright. Greg went through a whole bunch of traits that, that fit him to a T. But what, what he was was very honest. He liked to have things just 
right with no deception and, and things like that. I was remember I was running with him on the beach, yeah, in Cardiff, and uh, we were running along, and there was a guy standing there on the beach, and we, we went, and he said something as we were going by, and my dad said, "Wait, we passed him about about 25 yards," and Leonard said, "Wait a minute, stop, stop." What did that guy say? I said, I don't know what he said. I don't know what he, let's go back and see what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so, me, I'm just keep going here. I'm not worried about it. He, he didn't let things sit. He wanted to resolve things, I, I believe, with the truth. And he just, so we went back. And he, he put himself right up in front of the guy and said, did you say something to me? <laughs> what did you say? And the guy said, no, oh, nothing, nothing. <laughs> just hello. You know. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of guy he was. He just, uh, there's another story I have about the, the tree in our front yard. When June and I first moved into our house, there was a Malamuka right next to the, to, the, to the side of the house. Big tree. And the roots were upending the, the sidewalk and probably pushing into the house. And I think Greg and John and, and June and I were standing there trying to analyze the situation and figure out what to do. And, you know, going, oh, well, maybe we should hire somebody here and then, uh, maybe we should rent a saw, power saw, and, you know, what should we do with some Malaluka? I don't know. He's, Leonard comes up and says, where's the axe? <laughs> Give me the axe. So we gave it to him, and he chopped it up with pieces. <laughs> you know, that's just the way he was. So uh, God bless him, and uh, I'll, I'll miss him, and I'm sure you all will too. But he's still, you know, right here forever and ever in our hearts. Yeah, thank you, Pop. <laughs> Mark just left, but I hope somebody tells. Tell us uh, the story of that Pop told everybody else how he got the scars on the chest. So it's, 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 it's a great story. So uh, I'm just going to say a couple of things. Uh, I'm the youngest son. Uh, a little different late relationship. Uh, uh, I learned from these guys. So uh, I learned how to stay out of the way when I was young. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> But, and um, I never had Leonard as a coach, amazing one. But Leonard was the best football coach I ever had met. Uh, he taught me so much about football that in junior high school, I was the quarterback, and the coaches knew I knew more about football than they did. And they let me call my own play. Completely unheard. Completely unheard. So, but then there's a the tough side to that. Because when I got to high school, still playing quarterback, come home from a game at night, and I would get a two-hour play-by-play. <laughs> every play, get everything I did wrong. <laughs> Somehow skip the good things, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I got smart. If I was getting home late, sometimes I'd sit in the car and wait until they were asleep. <laughs> because I knew if we got to the next morning, she was only an hour. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I uh, helped Mom and Pop move into their apartment house. Pop and I came in uh, and uh, helped remodel the house. It's a great story. Is you were getting the house and everything. We were in there about a week. And all of a sudden, we're sitting in the living room one night, and there's this loud rumble. And you go, what the, what the heck is that noise? So, Pop goes, well, it's like 65 degrees. Why would somebody have their air conditioning on? Geez, I'm going to tell him what I think. <laughs> so he goes, stomping on how the house is look great. So he's gone half hour. I'm starting to get a little worried. He's gone 45 minutes. Uh, start getting oh great, I'm gonna have to go pick him up at the sheriff's office. <laughs> <laughs> he finally comes in a few minutes after that and uh, looks at me with this strange look 
He goes, it's the ocean. <laughs> Of love 
always shining. I always felt love there. Always accepted. Love and brothers. You two guys with special eyes to your brother from the outside. Always in love. Measure for me. Remember, I look at him and he had this little twinkle in his eye. I look at Grandpa, Leonard's dad, this wiry little guy, and he had that love in his eyes, that strength of honor, valor, a man of men, a mighty man. A mighty man and mighty women. And we were the love of his life. And um, I spent, I think, if I remember right, the night before I got married in their house. <laughs> with my grooms. Uh, and they just always open and welcome people into their homes. And that was because of that love. Thank you. And from our uh, hometown in uh, San Bernardino. I just remember one time I wasn't welcome at their house. <laughs> <laughs> well, the block we lived in had maybe 18 to 20 kids. And Leonard loved that. He would get out there, watch us play baseball, football. This one game, we were playing uh, baseball in the front yard. And I can't remember who broke the window. <laughs> it was a baby swan. It was Lance. A baby swan, you let go of the bat, and. <laughs> And we all stood there, all about 18 of us. <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> you know, okay, let's go home. And I ran by Grady Lance and they go, We are home. <laughs> as I was going down the driveway, Joe and Leonard were in the backyard reading. And he heard the commotion and that stomping and that, hey, hey! You know, when I ran in the house, my mom went, what are you doing? I'm looking out the window. <laughs> and there's Larry looking at the front window, and Gray and Lance standing there. I go, oh boy. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, but he took it really well. <laughs> Us boys were playing football. Basically, <laughs> and, and the other time, me and Greg, when we went down and Leonard was coaching football at San Bernardino High, we would grab the football and throw it around. And this one day, the team wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. So he told them, run lax. And one guy kind of, Leonard goes, if I beat you, you're going to do it two, three times. And Leonard took <laughs> out after the guy, and that guy got drunk, and Leonard beat the guy. <laughs> the guy had to keep running. You know. There was times when they were at Cypress College. Me and Greg, he invited me down, and it was a total fog out. And you remember the, the, when the guy went to kick off, he kicked off. And I'm standing by Leonard, because then nobody knew who was who. And they go, get the ball! Leonard's going, get the ball! <laughs> and the guy you're going back, we can't find it! Uh. You know, it, it was just... It, I think they ended up calling the game. I can't remember. But, and then you go back to when he ran cross country. Or I ran cross country. Greg ran really good. And this one, I'm, there was a picture of down there. It was one marathon Greg got me to go do. And you know how they take a picture of the guys who are coming by? Guess who's right behind me? <laughs> Leonard. <laughs> and he beat me that day. And I, you know, I didn't, you know, like they say, Leonard would walk up to him. <coughs> We're fast enough today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he knew how to do it. So, uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> story, personal story on, on sort of all about Leonard. So around that time, I was probably seven years old. Leonard was also the head of, uh, he ran the plunge at Paris Hill. 
the city pool yeah. there, Paris Hill Plunge, and it's a hot, smoggy city, you know, kids got to get in the pool in the summer from all over town, and our, our hometown was always a little bit of a rough place, right, even back in the day. It's one of the reasons he, get, he ended up being hired there, because in this rougher part of town, they had a high turnover of teachers and coaches for obvious reasons, because it was really tough. So anyway, uh, the summer job was he'd run the, the plunge, and we had a lot of uh, kids from the rough part of town would be there at the pool. I was sort of his helper that summer, just kind of hanging around, you know, just doing some, uh, you know, work for him. So, and he routinely would throw a guy or two out of the pool for horsing around, you know, tell him to stop jumping on people, whatever, and then he would literally sometimes pick them up by their swim trunks <laughs> and just carry them out, out, and out and say, come back when you learn how to behave, right? that kind of thing. We'd all have them submitted to that, probably even some of the chillers sometimes, if you guys are out of line. So, um, so we, he throws a guy out, um, and the guy kind of gave him a little back talk, and he didn't do anything about it. And the day ends, and we're wrapping up, we're walking through Paris Hill Park to the parking lot, and the sun's going down, and I see this guy, same guy, with a few tattoos, kind of a little bit of the, uh, the rough stuff, and his buddies, two buddies with him. So they're going to now kind of do something about this, mm -hmm. the man getting thrown out. And I'm probably seven, and there's my big studly dad with his big old marine muscles. Um, pushes me behind him like this. He's just like holding my hand and yeah, getting ready for whatever's going to come. And so this guy comes up and here comes a switch plate like that. You can still hear the switch plate. And he had it kind of this way because you could pull out of your pocket that way. So that was his first mistake. Well, his, second, his first mistake was trying to do something about this. His second mistake was that he had his switch plate in the wrong position. So. In a blink of an eye, the next thing I know, Pop has him, this guy, with his arm behind his back. The knife is in my dad's hand. And he looks at the other two guys and says, who's next? <laughs> you know, about this <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm thinking, you know, what's going to happen now? Well, most of us would get on our cell phone and call the police or tell somebody to do something about it. No, he does the opposite. So he eventually releases the guy. Right? He still has his knife. He clicks it back. He hands the knife to, back to the guy that was going after him with the knife. Looks him in the eye and says, here's your knife back. You might need it to defend yourself someday when you learn how to use it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there you go. <laughs> okay. So after after we play it in, in, in the afternoons on a Friday we have we invite kids that want to show up and play age about seven to we play tennis with these one kids, they started at seven, they never left until about eighteen. So they just kept coming back. So I remember early on Leonard I'd walk about to the front and I'd say, Leonard, you're you're riding in a Mitsubishi truck. And I say, isn't that kind of Saying, Joan keeps winning these things. <laughs> <laughs> so she would, Joan would write in these 25 words or less. She subscribed to a magazine. He said, I said, well, what else did she win? Oh, she won a bass boat. I think she won two cars, a bass boat. Oh, yeah. When we were early on, he says, yeah, we needed a refrigerator when we first got married. She won one of those. <laughs> <laughs> she, he'd tell me all the stories that she would win 25 words or less and she could come up with all these. <laughs> Leonard was, you're, he was lucky to have Joe. She offered her time for us, those of us in the choir who wanted to go for lessons. And of course, Leonard was the first one who said, I'm going. So uh, then I, I didn't drive in, but he offered and he would give me a ride out. So we all went to Phyllis's home for. Phyllis said 15 minutes each of them. That was it, the lesson. But uh, with her, we all 
did pretty good. And of course, Margaret would play, play the, piano, the uh, organ, pardon me, at church on Sundays. And we all learned our music and we did some solos and some uh, duets. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to your home, my, my daughter and I, about two, three years ago. And we took a CD where we had taped uh, the, your, your father singing. Mm -hmm. And he is, uh, there's some, a couple of songs with him singing with B. B, unfortunately, she passed away also, um, what, uh, three, three, two or three years ago already also. But it was wonderful, uh, you know, he al always offered to give me a drive, I could, uh, a ride, I could not drive in. So, and we had a meal for the whole choir at their home also. For Joan did all that good, which was wonderful. Oh yeah, I mean, that's where we're hiding. It's just, they kind of got to me a little bit, but uh, took care of business. So I think, uh, you know, that was a reflection of him. And it got me, actually, a career, those, those scars, because uh, he would go to the VA in LA back when there were no freeways and drive down Route 66 from San Bernardino to LA. And I'd go to the VA with him, um, and uh, he would get treatment for these war wounds, and uh, that was kind of the beginning of uh, uh, interest, my own interest in, in medical, and that, that uh, eventually kind of stuck. So anyway, any other stories or uh, comments? Can I yes, talk you back on, on Gloria mm -hmm. and Leonard, uh, uh, Gloria Sutton, mm -hmm. but I know Leonard again through uh, the choir, you know, and he would come and, and I think he was the only fellow there with all these girls. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, and part of, I used to run also a little bit, and I would see Leonard coming off the beach, running off part of all the time. One time I'm going up there, and he's coming, and he says, I uh, hope this is not embarrassing, but he says, you know, every time I run, after I run, I have to go pee, and I pee blood. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I said, oh, well, you better check on him. He did that. He was a tough fellow. And then turned out, I don't know, he went to you or somebody, and they checked out he had kidney uh, bladder stones that every time he runs, they would bounce around in there. <laughs> and he, well, tough guy, you know? <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> Funny, somebody convinced him to go see the doctor and had stones in there. <laughs> and then they took him out, and then he kept running after that continued. And one more thing to say the relationship between them and us. And then I think about it, his birthday is September 29th. Mm -hmm. Mine is September 30th. My mom was born 1922, and he was born 1921. And my mom's still alive. So they're in the same age, you know, kind of like, so the relationship with them is close, huh? <laughs> anyway. I will be Another fellow uh, Bruin. I am Chris Lucas. I'm a fraternity brother of Greg's and John's and Blake and Sue and Blake. Anyway, we've heard that Leonard's a man's man. When I was in the fraternity, when they'd come up, and the parents would come up, and I mean this in the right way, he was a ladies' man. <laughs> Extremely handsome. For those of you who did not know, and my mother's going, oh, she's Italian too. Oh, that Leonard, Jack, so handsome. <laughs> And I'd be going, great, Mom. I'd be going, I'd be out lunch. So that's, he's, you've heard the other, Leonard's a stud. We know that. John Zeitz, you're right. He never called me Chris. It was always Lucas. Get out of here, Lucas. <laughs> and what I was hoping, maybe, Bruce, you have a quick adjunct to this, but my dad taught me how to ski. Leonard taught his kids how to ski, and we had some fabulous ski, ski trips together, and we'd always stage them after your house since we'd leave San Bernardino. Anyway, one little short trip was Snow, uh, Snow Valley up in near Big Bear, running springs, and I don't know if you remember this, but we're up there, and it's a small area, and it's not that challenging. And you had to go in or something. You were fine, but you went in to eat or something. Look at us. We're getting ready. We're going up to the top. <laughs> and we went up to that back, right, Bruce? The, the top lift. I'm going to beat you down. <laughs> OK. Walls down the mountain. Excellent skier. I mean, it's, uh, it's perfect. Perfect. I mean, that's, 
you know, that's the lender. I knew he was your coach. I mean, it's pretty amazing what he has done. And thank you, Joan, because whenever we go to your house, there'll be plenty to eat and everything. And you know, we love your husband and our relationship. And uh, thank you. Will clearly be missed. And we know because he was that handsome guy. That's why you said yes in six weeks. <laughs> And they say that we're supposed to be done by 4.30, so if we're going to be on uh, Marine Corps time, that would mean we're almost done, but we're going to push it a little bit, and so if they want to get mean with us, uh, they can take it out on me, and you guys can bail me out of the brick. We're good. Yeah, yeah. We're good you guys can, you got some contacts over there. Right? Okay, so uh, unless we have any other uh, speakers, we would like to close with... Uh, a special song that you heard once already in the chapel, and uh, uh, Kevin Martin will uh, will close for us. I'd like to just end with uh, thanking everyone. I'd like to do it one at a time. Hopefully, we saw just about everyone individually coming in and during the session. Um, if I had time, I'd go one, one at a time all the way through. But basically, friends, relatives, uh, colleagues, uh, fellow. Uh, alums, neighborhood uh, friends, old friends, uh, your uh, Joan and Leonard's neighbors, uh, and the, uh, of course the San Bernardino crew uh, collectively and uh, immediate family. Thank you so much for uh, attending today and supporting us. And with that, we'll close with uh, a very special song that uh, Leonard and I kind of bonded on in the last week uh, that we had together. So, Kevin? Time to say goodbye. I think I was going to get my feet. On the storm, 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 your storm, 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 storm,